All right, good evening, good evening, good evening, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Alexandra Mitchell. I'm the Manager of Education and Public Programs here at the California African American Museum. I want to thank you for joining us for tonight's very special and timely and important public program. Uh, welcome back. If this is your first time rejoining us in the new year, we're so delighted that you've chosen to spend part of your evening with us. We hope that you will continue to join us. Please check out our website for our upcoming public programs, including our MLK Day celebration this coming Monday, January 18th. Um, tonight, as you all know, we are joined by Dr. Nicole R. Fleetwood, a writer, curator, and professor of American Studies and Art History at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She's the author of Making Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration and the curator of the exhibition of the same name currently on view at MoMA PS1 through April 4th of this year. Her books are on racial icons, blackness in the public imagination and troubling vision, public uh, performance, visuality and blackness, which is a staple in the field. She is also the co-editor of Aperture Magazine's Prison Nation issue, focusing on photography's role in documenting mass incarceration and co-curator co of Aperture's touring exhibition of the same name. Fleetwood has co-curated exhibitions and programs on art and mass incarceration at the Andrew Freeman House, Aperture Foundation, Cleveland Public Library, Eastern State Penitentiary, Hello Philadelphia, MoMA PS1, Mural Arts Philadelphia, the Zimarelli Art Museum, and the Urban Justice Center. Her work has been supported by the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center, NYPL's Coleman Center, for scholars and writers, ACLS, the Whitting Foundation, Denison Hill Residency, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Cultures, Scholar in Residence Program through the Andrew Mellon Foundation, as well as the NEH. Tonight, of course, Dr. Fleetwood joins us to discuss Making Time, the powerful document of inner lives and creative visions of people rendered invisible by America's prison system. Based on the interviews and with currently and formerly incarcerated artists, prison visits, and the author's own family experiences with the penal system, Marking Time shows how art can provide the impoverished, imprisoned, excuse me, with a political voice and offer a new vision of freedom in the 21st century. We invite you to use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screens to engage Dr. Fleetwood following her lecture this evening. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Fleetwood. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Is, are you? Um, thank you so much, Alexandra and uh, California African American Museum. I'm really excited to be here. I, I wish I was um, in California. I love um, California. I love visiting. Um, I hope everyone's healthy and well. I hear about um, how bad um, the COVID cases are, especially in the LA area. So I'm wishing everyone safety and health. Um, and I'm going to talk around a set of images. I, um, I'm going to share with you images from the book and from the exhibition. Um, and then um, I'll make sure we have time for, for, um, for questions um, um, after my presentation. And as Alexandra was saying, um, my book is Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Um, it is a project that is about um, uh, 10 years in the making. Um, in terms of actually researching and working on it, but the roots are much earlier and um, they're in my own family's um, experiences with um, incarceration. I grew up in a, um, a Rust Belt town in Southwest Ohio um, that was decimated by um, uh, deindustrialization and, um, and, and, and other issues that just really um, made the communities working class black and um, um, even the middle class black communities um, really, really struggling in, in the 80s onward. Uh, my cousin, Alan, I, I grew up with him and um, he was in prison um, and sentenced to life when he was 18. And it, he was sentenced like a few days after I graduated from college. And so uh, that experience really impacted me. Um, and it, of course, it deeply impacted him. He was released after 21 years in prison. Um, and But during those 21 years he was in prison, I would go back to Ohio every year. After college, I moved out to um, San Francisco. I went to Stanford. And I was moving around, living in different places. But every year, I'd go back to 
um, Ohio and, and, and sit with him and visit him. And often we would end these visits with these um, photographs that take place in prison visiting rooms. So this project really began when I um, put out uh, a stack of these images that I had stored um, under my bed and really started to integrate them into my daily life as a way of um, really bringing Alan into my presence as well as my other incarcerated relatives I would talk to the pictures. I just, I was also working through um, work, trying to work against how prisons not only erase um, people from our, our home life and our communities, but the kind of shame and stigma that many of us carry, whether we're even aware of that or not. And I was realizing that like um, how little I, I would bring him up or bring up my imprisoned relatives. And so I really wanted to to really profoundly work on that and, and undo that kind of um, work narrative in, in, that I was holding on to. And part of how, part of my journey through that was um, sharing these photographs during um, invitations to give talks like at cultural institutions like CAM or at universities. And so in like 2011, 2012, I just started talking about these images and talking about imprisoned loved ones. And from that, the project really grew to, um, in part because of Alan and other imprisoned relatives and people I knew who would introduce me to artists. I got very curious about the, um, the um, visual culture of incarceration and not just how it's um, presented to us through dominant media formations, but I was much more interested in what takes place inside prisons and the kind of the culture making that takes place among imprisoned people. And I go back to this image first because um, one of the things that I started to notice the more I looked at these images is like that they all have painted backdrops. And then I started studying how like those backdrops are painted by imprisoned people generally. And then the photograph itself is a is document uh, taken by an imprisoned photographer. So I got more and more interested in um, just kind of tuned into um, the forms of art making and, and visual culture that were, um, were taking place inside US prisons. Um, Ronnie Goodman is one of the artists that I met through as the project um, continued to expand. Um, Ronnie was actually born in the LA area um, and was imprisoned in San Quentin. And after his release from prison in 2008, 2009, he was an unhoused person from for over a decade in San Francisco where he was really active um, and um, Occupy and, and the movement to provide a safe and affordable housing to unhoused people. Um, while he was in San Quentin, he became a, a accomplished portrait artist. Um, and you see this self-portrait that he of, art, of himself at work and um, in the backdrop are many of the works that he had previously painted that he's repainted, re-represented um, in this really uh, powerful self-portrait. And one of the things that for me is, I opened the book with this, um, this image because I think it um, uh, encapsulates so much of the conditions of making art in prison um, around being, um, you know, held in punitive captivity, around uh, being stigmatized as, quote, a bad subject or as a prisoner or someone who broke a lawbreaker, um, that being in also his, like the blues of uh, the state issued clothes in California. Um, but it also really um, documents some of the spaces where art making take place. Like this is a workshop space run by um, the Arts and Corrections um, organization. It's a, it's a, a collective of nonprofits and programs throughout the state of California um, that is partly organized through the California Lawyers for the Arts. Um, one organization that's very active in it is the William James Association out of San Quentin. And um, Ronnie was enrolled in art classes there. And, um, and, and Ronnie passed um, in August of, of, of this year, of, of 2020, um, on the streets of San Francisco, you know, made more vulnerable um, uh, by the COVID pandemic. And I um, just want, you know, it's, from, it's really important for me to um, honor him when I um, uh, open up a presentation. Um, Ronnie's, Ronnie's Self-portrait self is also about a, um, one of the concepts that comes up for me in the exhibition in the book, which is penal space. And it's like the space, the built environment of the prisons, 
Um, it's the spaces where imprisoned people collaborate or work in isolation from their um, cells to um, workshop spaces to um, uh, to um, recreational spaces and, 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 and the like. Um, but it's also, penal space is also about a psychic space of uh, imprisonment that I think is very powerfully represented by Tamika Cole's um, graphite collage, Locked in a Dark Calm, that she made while um, on a work release program in, in Alabama. Um, and this, both of these works that I've shown you so far are in the, ex they're in the book and the exhibition, along with um, Gilberto Rivera's and Institutional Nightmare. So um, three concepts that run throughout the book and the exhibition um, are ideas of penal space and then penal matter. And that's the materials that imprisoned people use to make art. Um, and it's really um, kind of negotiating or navigating around the material constraints, um, how much, uh, how little access imprisoned people can get to art supplies. Um, working with contraband items, working with found items, um, organic matter um, found in um, um, on the prison yard. Like one artist that uh, uh, Todd Tarselli does these really beautiful paintings on leaves that he picks up in the yard. Um, artists will incorporate soil from the yard into their paintings, um, like a painting I'll show you by G uh, Jared Owens in a, in a second. Um, and Gilberto Rivera used his state issued Browns, um, he was in federal prison in New Jersey um, with um, and created an art collective, a multiracial art collective with, with three other artists featured in the book and in the exhibition, um, Jared Owens and Jesse Crimes. And so this is one of the works he made while in federal prison um, and partly in response to how he was stigmatized and overly surveilled more so than other imprisoned people because he had been labeled a gang member. And it was a, a label that no matter what he did, he couldn't shake it. And so much of his art was confiscated or sc overly scrutinized um, for like gang, gang symbols. And so this was his response was an institutional nightmare. Um, Kenneth Reams work also is another example of, of penal matter. Kenneth is currently, Kenneth, excuse me, is currently um, in prison, um, he's been on death row since the mid '90s. Since he was 18 years old, um, the youngest person. He's also African American, youngest person um, on death row in Arkansas uh, when he was sentenced at 18. Um, and while um, in solitary confinement, he on death row, he makes incredible art. He also um, runs a nonprofit. He is um, featured in a documentary called Free Man. Um, he's an active public speaker. Um, um, his case is um, represented by the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, and he uses the wrappers, the food wrappers, the discarded wrappers from other imprisoned people on death row, um, really commenting on the extractive practices, the exploitative practices that take place, especially among um, industries and businesses that profit from imprisonment and suffering. Um, and so these are some of the um, the, the food items or, or snack items that imprisoned people can purchase on death row for exorbitant prices. Um, and so capitalization is really him commenting on the kind of financialization of imprisoned people, but also um, the items that are sold to them at um, extractive prices. <laughs> Um, and and like you know in kind of I think a similar vein, thinking about not only um, the material world but also thinking about the bodies of imprisoned people, especially Black and Brown imprisoned people, through the concept of penal matter. Is someone like James Huff, uh, who James was released from prison in August of 2019, after serving 27 years. He was sentenced when he was 17 to a, a sentence called life without parole that is now unconstitutional to, to, to give out to, um, to minors. Um, and that was part of what got him released. Um, during his time in prison, he made literally thousands of works of art. Many of them are watercolor um, paintings that he did on prison documents. Um, and this is one of, what, one of my favorite works of his um, um, because of not only the composition, but also just like, you know, just um, the richness of meaning um, here um, with I am the economy. 
Um, and then I said that another concept is penal time. So it's penal space, penal matter, and then penal time. And a lot of imprisoned artists, um, you know, experiment with time because their living time, their sentence is time as punishment. So it's a measurement of punishment every second, every minute, every hour in prison. Um, and um, one way that um, imprisoned people um, kind of feel like they can take some control over that um, the use of, uh, of time as punishment is by turning to um, culture making and, and creativity um, and literally um, making things as a way of managing that time. Um, and um, Jared Owens, like some of the art, other artists in the exhibition, um, also connect the idea of penal time to the lung subjugation of, of, of Black people. Um, he here is connecting uh, it to uh, specifically uh, slave, ch chattel slave economies and um, uses the icon of the Brook slave ship that art historian Cheryl Finley really beautifully uh, documents in her book, Committed to Memory. So he uses that image, the Brook, the Brook slave ship, and he overlays it with um, Ferriton prison where he had been in prison in New Jersey. So you have the holding cells of the prison and the slave ship lined up. And then in the center where you see the, the dark spaces, he's incorporated um, soil, um, penal matter into the painting itself. Um, and, and Marie, I'm sorry, Mary Enoch Elizabeth Baxter is another artist who um, makes these connections um, be, uh, um, between penal time and the temporalities of black captivity, especially um, in, on, on this continent. And so um, Ain't I a Woman is definitely in, in reference to um, a well-known speech uh, by Sojourner Truth. Um, and it's also a beautiful video triptych. Um, she's a sound arti artist and video artist where she is rapping about her experience being um, shackled while um, pregnant and in labor for 43 hours. Um, and just really connecting that to like um, the politics of black women's reproduction of um, control over black women's bodies and sexuality. Um, uh, and it's a powerful work that you can um, find. It's, it's, it's on exhibition in, um, in the show, but it's also, you can see it on YouTube. It's called Ain't I a Woman. Um, and so in the, some of the time I have left, I wanna just, um, so I, I went over like penal um, space, penal matter and penal time. and um, with the time left, I want to show you some of the um, kind of genres and uh, themes that have come up um, across many of the artists. And and so one of um, one of the things that have come up is um, the use of portraiture. That um, it's probably the most common form of art making in prison, and it takes so many different forms, um, from kind of traditional graphite drawings to collage to uh, mixed media um, portraits um, to um, a series like this by Jesse Crimes. You'll see that a lot of also in prison portrait artists are into seriality. So they're creating like portrait series. Um, and the, these are um, headshots and mug shots taken from magazines, legal documents and the like and transferred from the magazines or, or legal documents onto prison bars of soaps. And so Jesse made this um, series over his first year in prison when he was in solitary confinement and had almost no access to art supply. So he used the, the very kind of bare materials available to him in his cell to make this series. And, um, and I think in total there, he created like 292 of them. Um, another example of the kind of use of portraiture um, in prison is, um, is to what I say is to like, um, kind of amass or revise one's carceral biography. So it's to take what the way that the state has depicted one, often through legal discourse, through paper, through documents, and to um, turn that into something else, and to turn it for uh, turn it into a work of art, turn it into another mode of self presentation, self representation. Um, and Russell Craig's uh, self-portrait is uh, in 2016. It's like a really um, kind of majestic version of this this kind of revisioning um, of carceral biography and a claiming of the tradition of portrait making. And so it's a it's 10 feet by eight, and it's like four panels, um, and across the the backdrop are 
um, all his prison documents. And these go back to like his time in foster care at age five to like group homes to state prisons, you know, and uh, for him, it was really important to um, collect these materials and invent when he was out on parole, going to these various bureaucratic offices, getting records. Um, and then, um, you know, this self-proclamation, um, uh, he said the crosshairs was also very important for him um, to incorporate into this. George Anthony Morton um, was in federal prison for 10 years and um, he said he studied like, quote, the great Western tradition and he says it with irony, um, but he really spent those 10 years um, doing like um, serious study of um, portrait traditions and practicing portrait making um, so much so that when he was released from prison, he was accepted to the Florence Academy and won best portrait of the year for this portrait he created on called Mars in 2016. <laughs> and then I have a chat, there's a chapter in the book um, that's about art made in solitary confinement. And, and that's one of the more difficult challenge, uh, chapters. And um, it's one where every, you know all, all the people who are documented in that chapter, everyone doesn't survive that experience. So it's about um, the just unbelievably uh, a common use of solitary confinement and the various ways that it gets framed as management control unit, protective custody and um, uh, these other kind of ways of administrative segregation, but it's all solitary confinement. And, you know, and um, there's a lack of transparency at, in, in terms of uh, um, the public actually knowing how many people are suffering in solitary confinement that, you know, anywhere around 80 to 100,000 people in, on any given day are in solitary confinement. That number is higher during COVID because so many people who um, have come down ill or suspected of being um, uh, carrying the virus um, are put in solitary confinement. That's the ways that a lot of prisons are quote managing the crisis inside prison. Um, one of the artists who's, who's um, featured prominently in the book and the exhibition is Ojuri Lutalo, who was a member of the Black Liberation Army um, and spent 22 years in solitary confinement for his political beliefs. Um, and use that time to create like hundreds and hundreds of collages that really documented his experience um, and also the experience of other um, imprisoned uh, political radicals. And now I'm gonna show you um, some of the um, works um, that are in, in on display at PS1. So the show at PS1 is also called Marking Time. Um, it is about 8,000 square feet. Um, we've had to make some changes to it during COVID and, so, and, and, and actually some new work um, came up for artists during the, um, the delay. The show was initially scheduled to open April 5th of 2020, but because of the pandemic, it was pushed back to September 17th. Um, the museum is open um, and uh, at 25% capacity. Um, it, the show opened September 17th. We've had um, like 15,000 people safely come in and see the show over that span of time. And the show will be up until um, April 4th of, of this year, 2021, if any of you um, in the viewing audience are living in the New York metropolitan area, um, you can reserve um, a ticket on PS1. The viewing is free. Um, and a new work that, um, um, was made for the exhibition is Sable Ely Smith's Landscape 5. Um, Sable is featured um, in the code of the book and the, conc the conclusion is all about her practice and, um, and, um, and um, how that practice is somewhat um, influenced by her experience um, of growing up with an incarcerated father. Um, and she uses neon. She also um, references blue and um, I, uh, in the book and the exhibition, I talk about carcel blue as, and as, as a color, also very, very emblematic of prisons in California, a type of blue that's connected to uh, the prison industrial complex. Um, and, and that is about uh, the, uh, not only punishment of people, but the business of punishing people. Um, and I love how she, uh, and, you know, also uh, carcel blue is, reference um, is very much kind of invoked by like 
the Blue Lives Matter movement, which you'll see there an, an artist in an exhibition taking that up. Um, and um, you see that here in Sable's, Sable's piece as well. <laughs> so when you walk into the main gallery space, so Sable's exhibition, ex, I'm sorry, Sable's neon sculpture is in the lobby. And then when you walk into the main gallery, um, you see the sign and you also um, can enter this room that um, is a series, an incredible series by a person who's currently in prison, uh, Mark Lotney, um, uh, who's in prison in Pennsylvania. And since 2014, he's been working on this series called Pyrrhic Defeat, a visual study of mass incarceration. Um, and it is about the kind of tradition of portraiture. It's about the veneration of the, the sitter um, and especially claiming a veneration for imprisoned people who've been very much devalued. Um, and for him, it is also, um, there's a kind of performative quality to, to it also because he asked um, everyone who sits for him, these are all people in prison with him, um, if they'd sit for 20 minutes. So these are all 20 minute sketches. Um, and he has continued to do this work during COVID, even though he, he and his pres the, the, uh, the prison he's in has been on um, a really long lockdown where he's, um, they're basically in solitary confinement. Um, and you see this new, this new set of images of um, imprisoned men in, in mask and, and PPE. Um, and then you walk into this space that is really about kind of site specificity. Um, you have a, um, a, a dual video projection by um, Ashley Hunt, who's an artist, abolitionist, and an educator out in Southern Cal, he teaches at Cal Arts. Um, it's called Ashes Ashes, and it's a really powerful one hour uh, video that thinks about the past, present, and the future of Rikers, especially around the closed Rikers campaign, um, the, the history of it as a penal colony, and really uh, uh, kind of speculative uh, vision of it in the future as a place where, it, as he says, cages are ruins. Um, and then um, on, on the walls next to that, you have works by Jared Owens, who did the Elapsium um, uh, painting triptych with the, the um, slave ship. And, and then um, Gilberto Rivera, they were incarcerated together. And in the center, you have these incredible miniatures that are really about like Americana created by um, Dean Gillespie, who was in prison with my cousin, Alan. He was in um, a prison in Ohio for 20 years. And so this is another um, vid view of, of that room. Of, um, and then I'm gonna, from there, you'll walk into um, a room where Jesse Crimes, 15 foot by 40 foot, um, Apocalyptine is on display, and this is a really powerful example of penal matter. Is these this um, mural consists of 39 prison bed sheets that he created over a three-year period um, using um, image transfer from the New York Times magazine and other kind of magazines, and really making um, that kind of deep commentary on on social valuation, especially in uh, uh, a time period uh, where uh, carcerality structures so much of how we understand we understand value and freedom and mobility, and so he has these tiers of um, hell, earth, and heaven. Um, from there, you walk into another room that's also very powerful examples of penal matter, uh, and this is like a pairing that was really important for me to have in the same space, and that's it's another work by Sable Elise Smith who um, is a contemporary African American conceptual artist. She also teaches at Columbia. Um, and she did this uh, six prong sculpture with the, the, the blue, like the blue and gray that looks like the stools that people will sit on in prison visiting rooms across from the six prong sculpture by uh, Daniel McCarthy Clifford, who was who's formerly incarcerated, really, was released from prison, went on to get his BFA and MFA. And they're both dealing with very similar ideas, although they didn't know each other and they were working across very different kind of landscapes uh, and carceral geographies. And so for me, having their work together was really powerful. You also see a diptych by Justin Sterling with the, it's part of his Broken Window series where he collects broken windows from the streets of Brooklyn and New York, especially construction sites or highly gentr rapidly gentrifying areas. 
and then uh, incorporates plant life into them. Um, and let's, I just want to make sure I keep have enough time for it. So I'll talk for about 10 more minutes and then um, would love to hear your questions and engage. Um, and from there, you enter this room that is, a, is about like um, long, um, long term incarceration, maximum security, solitary confinement. It's a really, um, in some ways, it's minimalist, but it's a very heavy room that um, visitors actually spend a, a lot of time in because there's a lot to absorb and some of it is text based. Uh, it incorporates uh, photographs by the uh, well known um, influential couple photographers, uh, Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick, a married couple out of New Orleans who've been documenting prisons in the state of Louisiana since the very early 80s. And these are some of their really powerful photographs over about a 35 year period um, from I think the early 80s to the mid 2000s, I think so, um, of, uh, of Angola. Um, and uh, from there you walk into a room <laughs> that's an installation by Rowan Renee um, about where Rowan incorporates their father. Their father was in, in prison for sex crimes and they were able to get their father's uh, records um, and, in, and then prints their father's records on textiles and this is all by hand. And part of the actual making of this, Rowan said, was a, like the process of healing um, over over um, also being someone victimized by their father and um, um, also thinking about what the, the work of harm and healing in abolition movements. Um, one, a room that also I think um, really captures viewers that viewers spend a lot of time in is a room um, that was actually curated by two formerly incarcerated artists who became mentors and friends in prison. And that's uh, Russell Craig, who's the portrait artist, and James Huff, who I said did uh, hundreds of works on watercolors. And so the small works are by, by James Huff that he made during his 27 years in prison. And the large mixed media portraits are new works by Russell Craig, where he's making portraits on leather bags, on canvas, also incorporating blood, thinking about like the roar shark, uh, tests and how those are the kind of psychiatric evaluations that are forced um, often, often violently and traumatically on imprisoned people and also people in foster care. Um, and so this is a really powerful room, room where you see the conversa ongoing conversation that has taken place between them in prison um, and also outside of prison. And then I'll show you the final room. Uh, the final room is a mixture of like very, um, I think, very visually, like uh, powerfully, colorfully saturated works. Um, some uh, collaborative work by a collective out of Miami called Women on the Rise, working with young women and girls in Miami detention centers, um, the incorporation of the hoodies, um, the color orange, which is again, a carcel color, especially this color orange um, that marks one's age category, one's newness to prison. Orange signifies different things in different prisons. And behind that are um, photographs by um, Sarah Bennett, who was a public, who was a um, defense attorney for many years before turning to visual advocacy uh, through photography. And her project, her work focuses on women who've been sentenced to life or to long time imprisonment. Um, documenting them inside prison and also their transition out of prison. <laughs> I mentioned um, Blue Lives Matter and, and um, art that really is uh, critiquing and commenting on that. And um, in the center of the last room are these two sculptures by the artists, American artists, I'm Blue Two and Three. And an American artist for many, for, you know, has been working with thinking about um, not only uh, thinking about the carceral landscape very broadly, thinking about the use of technology, uh, predictive policing, um, and in this work, he uh, they are thinking about the um, indoctrination of, of police forces through police academies and also the militarism of policing and the kind of combat military mentality that's that's very much about the kind of ideology of of indoctrination of, um, of police police officers. And of course the Blue Lives Matter as this like 
um, very um, outright uh, counter movement um, against uh, anti-Black police violence. Um, and the, the behind um, American artists work, you see a wall um, that is in honor of, of Ronnie Goodman. It incorporates um, many of the, like seven, eight of the portraits that he made during his time um, in San Quentin, as well as his self-portrait and also one of his um, works um, that was about uh, documenting um, the Occupy movement. And there's another a better image of that. Um, and that's it. So I'm gonna stop sharing um, and I'm um, excited to take questions or hear your comments, anything you wanna discuss. Incredible. So one of the questions that we have, Dr. Fleetwood says, can you address the idea of art making as a way of building and redefining community among incarcerated persons? I really love that question. And so um, one, so one of the concepts that I, I, I develop in the book is called carso aesthetics. And it's the, the practice of, or the production of art and the conditions of unfreedom. But I also think about it more broadly about art making that engages with carcerality. Um, what I also say is that it's a relational practice that puts imprisoned people in conversations with other imprisoned people, with loved ones, with non-incarcerated publics, that it's a tight art making becomes a way of really um, refuting the mandate of prison, which is isolation, which is uh, rendering one in, ir quote irrelevant to public culture, right? And that art making is uh, about, you know, especially art making and in, in, in these forms are really about a way of engaging the public when you've been rendered invisible or removed from it. Um, and so the relational bonds are really, really, the relational practices and the bonds that are forged through those practices are really important. And in prisons across the United States, you have these informal art collectives that are emerging around art making. Art also becomes often a sanctioned space where you have uh, people across racial, ethnic, and gender lines actually coming together in prison. Prisons are places that are like that function like apartheid, where there's lots and lots of segregation and separation. And in many um, um, state and federal prisons, the art workshop or you know the table where people are gathering to draw becomes a space where you see folks interacting across those differences. And um, I interviewed over seventy artists, and this was a recurring thing that all the artists would say to me is like it was one of the ways that they met people like outside of their like you know their um, their either self identified group or the group that they have been placed in by the state. It was through art making. Incredible. Um, our next question asks. Um, can you share some of the challenges that incarcerated artists face in physically getting their art out of prison? Uh, I imagine many works are confiscated by COs or prison staff. Yeah, I mean, so that's a great question. And, and I think it's tricky for a lot of people, like um, some of the people who've already been released were more willing to share than people who are still in prison, right? For obvious reasons. For um, a lot of people who are in prison are, um, they, they have to be, um, they, they have to guard those relationships that are helping them, helping facilitate um, getting their art into the hands they want their art to be in. Um, and so I honor that kind of privacy or, you know, confidentiality around that. Um, for some of the artists who were released, like Jesse Crimes, those 39 prison bed sheets that made that huge mural he would make one panel and then send it out of prison. And he would, he had a friend who worked in the mail room and they would find ways of getting it out. But what's amazing about that is he did that over a three year period and he didn't see the work together until he was released. So he would make a panel and, you know, kind of almost memorize what he made and he'd use his desk as a horizon. So he knew that he at least had a horizon for each. And it wasn't until he was released that he was able to actually put the work together and see it all in its completion. Incredible. Talk about use of creativity, right? Um, it's something that can kind of follow up with that question. It says, can you talk more about the choice to consider the work of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated artists alongside artists 
who have not been as directly affected by the system, what do you think is gained by having these two perspectives side by side? Yeah, it was very, it's very important for me, like, um, you know, as I was, uh, so, I mean, one of the, for me, one of the things that about what, something that I gained out of take, kind of take, being able to take my time with this project. And, and this is a project that I did after I had tenure, right? So it was like, I didn't, I wanted to feel, um, really committed to what I released and not feel like I had to rush something out. So it's something that I actually spent a really long time working on, writing many versions of it. You know, it just like it, it and, and, and as I got further and further along, it was really clear to me that I did not want this to be about siloing imprisoned artists into a type of category that separates them from broader circuits, uh, trends, movements, uh, a currency. And I don't mean by currency as money, but I mean like, uh, I mean like current, like an aesthetic current that kind of flows that the walls of the prison can't stop that from flowing in and out. And I also wanted that uh, those aesthetic currents and practices to, I was, very careful not to write as if they emerge from quote outside prison and then go into prison. I, I was much more interested around um, something that felt um, um, like uh, that there's more of a saturation. And part of what it, and, and you know, we use this word impenetrable to talk about prisons, it's a problematic word. And I really wanted to write about the aesthetic with the kind of porosity, like as a abolitionist thinking about those walls as as being a, as being porous and ideas and art and aesthetics as something that can um, move around and not be bifurcated or siloed or separated. And actually, you know, and so I engage with um, certain uh, you know, the black radical tradition in certain historic moments where uh, uh, imprisoned intellectuals and artists were at the for forefront of ideas and aesthetic. And you still see some of those practices like the black arts movement um, was very active in prison um, and many imprisoned people were <laughs> part of that. Um, and that tradition is still very much alive in a lot of contemporary prisons. Um, so for me, I, the, I, the project really became about like, how do we think of more capaciously um, and not romantically, but more broadly about the impact of prisons on culture. And I don't see in a lot of academic research on that. I see it like, pop culture representations of it. Uh, often the academic writing about prisons is, is very like about kind of political economy, geography, uh, sociology, um, demographics that, you know, and I really wanted to think like, what about culture? How has, you know, the expanse, the complicated system is just like a, this mammoth of a like, gargantuan intertwined systems. It's not one thing that is the carceral state. How does that really impact culture? And I don't think you can do that work by just looking at artists who've never been in prison or artists who are in prison that you have to think about um, how those, uh, how these kind of practices and one's relationship to carcerality um, Act, uh, inf impacts one's material access and, and you know, and how I did it, ideas are just moving. They're constantly, no one owns an idea, you know? There are two questions that uh, I believe kind of go hand in hand here. Um, they're of course, thanking you for the presentation. Um, and, then, and then asking if you can share if any of these people were artists, artists prior to their time in, in prison. And then also couple with that, um, what, is, what was your research process? How did you learn about these artists, um, especially the, those that are still imprisoned? Yeah, so yes, many of them, it's, uh, again, I said I, I interviewed like over 70 people and 
And it wasn't just like a one-off interview. You'll see that like some people I, you know, I got to know over like a six year period and they, it's many, many, many conversations with collaborating, doing talks. I often do talks with um, people I've interviewed or who were part of the book. Um, and um, so this is partly about method. I, I think you'll have to ask, re, I, the method question stuck with me that what was the first part of that? that do you? You asked me two questions that were connected. Um, if, if they were artists prior to their time in prison. Um, and so the stories are as diverse as the artists are. Some of them, like uh, Jesse Carms, who did Apocalypse on, on the bed sheets, part of the panel behind me, uh, my, my screen. Um, and on the other side is Maria Gaspar, who's an incredible artist uh, who's been doing co collaborative work out of Chicago. She, she's a, also a professor at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, but Jesse went to art school and um, actually was arrested, you know, not shortly after he graduated with his BFA. Mm -hmm. So there were some people who have, um, who are trained in like, um, in um, these tr recognized traditions. All of them have training and I don't, and I question our, the way we use self-taught because in some ways we're all, it's, we have, it's, you know, even when we're, I, I don't believe that anything, I don't believe we learn anything without influence, right? So there are, there's different ways of thinking about traditions and schools and, and, and there's a very, there's a robust school and traditions that take place around culture making in prison. And anyone who's been in prison or have really loved and gotten to know deeply people in prison will tell you that creativity is at the heart of survival in prison. Um, so I wanted to honor those traditions and um, not feel like I needed to have a category to describe those traditions as something apart from what we consider established art traditions. And what I say is that all art exists in relationship to institutions. Absolutely. Um, we're receiving a couple of questions about um, access. Um, the general question is, I wonder if you could talk a bit about how you were able to learn about and to access the works of currently incarcerated um, artists. Was access a challenge? And did you experience any pushback from carceral authorities? So the access is, as again, I think this is one of the, it's when you spend, it's the, it benefits from 10 years where that I could work on it because meaning that access in the beginning was difficult because I also had to figure out the parameters of the project. And there was so much I didn't know that I didn't even know I didn't know, right? It's because as much as I've visited people I love in prison, I've never been imprisoned. So there are a lot of questions that I had and I did, you know, like, like I didn't know that portraiture was like a huge, huge thing in prison. It's like the, you know, so there's, I had to be a student and I had to um, be open to learning and be really appreciative and grateful to people who would take me under their wings. These are people in prison and people formerly in prison to teach me what they knew and to do that and to um, do that generously because this is also about their own suffering and, and stigma, to, stigma, you know, that these are people that suffered and that I was um, acquiring knowledge um, from them based on how they survived that kind of suffering. Um, so that was also part of my method. Like I go, I got, I went in not knowing and, um, and then access got easier because the more I met people, the more they introduced me to other people. So access to people got easier. Access, I also connected with organizations that have been doing these, this work for a long time. Then I, you know, would have parents of imprisoned sons and daughters say, hey, you know, I, I, people started literally reaching out to me, you know, sharing, sending art, you know, but that was, that's where time was important, that this was something that couldn't be rushed, that it had, I had to just take my time with it. Absolutely. We have time for maybe two more questions. So I'm going to try to. I, one person asked if, if people got paid and I want to answer that right away. Yes. Oh, please. I'll, like, yes. I'll, uh, PS1's policy is that any artist who's in an exhibition gets an honorarium. And we worked very carefully with allies, family members, organizations, especially people in prison to figure out how to safely make that happen. Awesome. Happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, 
the two here, I'm sorry, these got sorted a little strange here. Um, one of the questions we have uh, says, how does this project intersect with other your other areas of interest in study? Oh, that's a great question. So, I mean, you know, um, I, I, all my books are on visual culture and, and race in some ways. Um, and so in that way, for sure. But I think, I, I think I'm also always interested in um, pursuing areas of visual culture that are derogated, that are under research, that people often um, uh, assume they already know something about it, you know, like say defamiliarizing people with what they take uh, for granted. Um, I have written some um, art catalog essays, but I don't generally write about quote super famous artists. I mean, not that I'm not interested, but I'm very much more interested in culture making among um, working class people, working poor people, people who are, you know, um, marginalized in various ways and really thinking about the culture making that is a part of survival practices. Like I really, really love thinking about culture making as a part of our survival practices. You know, one of the questions that I dismissed and I didn't want to ask because I think sometimes people hate being asked this question is, you know, you spend so much time on this project, this particular project um, and on the exhibition as well. And it's taking up so much space, I can imagine. Um, what are you thinking of your next project and, and where you're kind of- I've been, so one of the things I said, this project hasn't, isn't over it's you know there's you know it's we have a lot of programming coming up at ps1 um there's a website markingtimeart.com that we've put a lot of updates on um you know we're hoping that we can travel the show so so for me the show this project is more than a book and more than an exhibition and it's still kind of morphing and and growing so that's one um one part of that and then and then i've also been working before I even did Working Time, I had started another book project because I can sometimes I'll work on like two things at a time, you know, so I have another book that's like pretty far along, but I don't I, I that one I don't share that much about at this point. We respect that. Alrighty, and our last question for the evening will be, um, are you aware of any community art space for formerly incarcerated people programs and communities that support artists once they return from prison. Oh, I love that. Yeah, um, so I mean, I would say to check out, uh, one, I, I always say start local um, and find out if you are re-entering, really find out um, what kind of re-entry services and uh, community uh, uh, engagement projects are happening locally, but there's also a, a, a national network um, called the Justice Arts Coalition that is like, um, organizations and people all over across the country doing this kind of work and you can go onto the website uh, for Justice Arts Coalition It's run by Wendy Jason sign up for the newsletter they send out really and they do like uh, zoom uh, workshops for free uh, trainings meet and greet especially you know just so that people are in community they're, they're like weekly they have these great programs um, so that and it's a way of meeting people across the country who are doing this kind of work Awesome. Well, uh, thank Dr. Fleetwood, thank you so much for your time, your brilliance, your energy, and sharing all of your hard work and dedication um, to the creativity and art of incarcerated persons with us this evening. Um, I do hope that you all will, of course, of course, if you're on the East Coast, please do check out the exhibition, check out the website that was just mentioned about marking time if you are not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also I'll, I'll put, the, put the website in. And what what's what's your next program this week? You all have been um, doing some, so many great programs. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Tonight is actually my last program for the week. I'm very thankful about that. But our next program is on Monday for MLK Day. We have a day-long series of programs beginning at 10 a.m. with the um, Youth Choir of Los Angeles, um, followed by a number of panels and family programs. So we hope you join us for that. Also, please do purchase the book, Marking Time, via SOM Books, our, our lovely book vendor that we love to partner with here in Los Angeles in Lamert Park. They are available for purchase online. Yeah. If you're here, please do visit SOM in person safely uh, during their abbreviated hours during COVID. Uh, please do follow Dr. Fle uh, Fleetwood online as well during, uh, through her various channels. And um, thank you again for joining us. I hope you all have a lovely evening and everybody have a good night.
Thank you all so much. This is great. Thanks for the Bye.